Hello, uh, my name's Gareth Morgan. Uh, we're here at IMW 2019 in Boston. Um, I'm uh, from New York and I'm with my good friend and colleague, Mark Grab, who's a senior physician in Heidelberg in Germany. Um, we've seen some great genomics in this, in this meeting, um, some very exciting results and the, the first results were around somatic variation and uh, mutational analysis in, in myeloma. So how did you see those results in the context of your kind of proteomic data? So, I mean, we are still facing the big challenge for the somatic variations that it's so heterogeneous in myeloma, right? So we have um, re relatively few recurrent mutations. We have mm -hmm. a lot of mutations, right? I think you presented that, you know, like if you go whole genome sequencing, you get, I don't know, thousands and thousands of mutations. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the big challenge is uh, to make sense out of it, mm -hmm. right? So whether we can find groups or clusters or networks, you know, that at the end of the day drive the disease, drive the proliferation mm -hmm. of, of, of the myeloma cells. And um, so in this respect, um, we might have to look for transcriptomics, what you talked about as well, right? To see whether we can group patients uh, into um, functional clusters. I mean, if you go for clustering in, um, in uh, transcriptomics, you end up with like 12 subgroups of myeloma, right? Yes. Um, and uh, I think it's also important now to go one step further on a proteome level, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, DNA, RNA is basically just uh, the basis for the actual action that is taking place in the, in the, in the cell, which is on the proteome kinome level, right? uh, where all the decisions are made uh, how the cell is going to proliferate or not, right? Um, so, not sure about what you think about the transcriptome slash somatic variance in that respect. So, what was uh, like kind of good for me is um, we did an analysis at the RNA level and pretty much showed that if you had uh, you know, RAS mutations, you activated the MAP kinase ERK pathway, and if that pathway was activated, the other heavily mutated pathway, NF kappa B, was downregulated. And so it was the synergy of, between those two pathways. And the point that struck me was you don't see those mutations, the ones that make the cells really grow in the mugus phase of disease, nor in the smoldering myeloma. What they do is they seem to drive out the expansion of the most recent common ancestral um, clone that then comes to dominate the, the marrow. And I, I think your results, like, kind of, I, th I think they sort of backed up that as a, an idea. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree because, I mean, what we see, especially in, in early myeloma, right, that mm -hmm. we see um, on the proteome and the pr protein level, we see an activation of the nf kappa b pathway in most uh, patients and a smaller patient subset um, that is obviously driven by, by a MAP kinase, McERK activation mm -hmm. here, phosphorylating of ERK, right? Phosphorylation of ERK. Uh, and that was mutually exclusive almost completely. Mm -hmm. uh, and this situation absolutely changed when we looked at newly diagnosed, or of course, even more at the relapsed refractory setting, where the uh, MAP kinase activation in maybe an interplay with AKT activation, so. Um, took a much larger part of the patients and the nf kappa b signal seemed to be really going down. Although we always have to say we're looking at markers, so we don't have really signatures on the protein level, right? Mm -hmm. So we'd only look at markers. So they might be overruled by certain mutations. So, um, But um, as far as we look at the actually activated, so phosphorylated kinase, mm -hmm. I think there's a pretty strong signal that there's, as you said, really this dichotomy between uh, nf b and urx slash akt driven myeloma, and that this expands over time, so uh, meaning in newly diagnosed patients and in relapsed patients compared to MGUS, MGUS or, or smoldering at least. Right? But the, the good thing about it is, I, th I think, so um, targeting individual mutations has somehow or other not been successful because of clonal heterogeneity. But if you target the pathway, which is very frequently activated, we should be able to have um, 
kind of ERK driven therapies and NF kappa B driven therapies that should work in myeloma. I think that's what your results say. I, that's what they suggest, at least. I, I absolutely agree. At least in, in early or in, in newly diagnosed myeloma, yeah? as you have seen. If you look at the later stage of the refractory myeloma, there you have all of a sudden STAT reactivation, MYC expression, right? Mm. So the picture becomes way more complicated. Probably also explaining that uh, why very few single agents work in relapsed refractory myeloma, right? Mm. And those who do usually have a very broad action, um, like the typical so-called dirty drugs. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, the other um, thing that I, I think came out in the meeting was um, point mutations, single nucleotide variants, as they're called. It's been difficult to find prognostically important point mutations. So when we did a study, it all kind of boiled down to, we looked at like hundreds and thousands of mutations, but really it was P53 mutations, they inactivate P53 that were prognosis, this sort of double hit idea. So. There were data presented about um, chromosomal rearrangements and structural rearrangements, and those seem to be somewhat more prognostically important than um, simple point mutations. And I, I guess the reason they do that is because they affect boundaries between kind of chromatin structures called TADs leading to overexpression of genes. So how much do you think that sort of mechanism may play out in terms of sort of signal, signal omics? Well, I think that's a very good but a very difficult question. It's hard mm -hmm. to answer now. Uh, I agree that structural variations certainly might have a, a, a deeper or more profound impact because they either overdrive a uh, gene like, like mm -hmm. really heavily or completely shut it down, right, L yeah. uh, compared to maybe subtle modifications by mm. some point mutations. Um, and again, how they then converge downstream or after translation and so on to, to, to a protein level, I think that's completely unknown. I mean, mm. the, what we can say uh, from our data set is that, uh, uh, and others have shown that in, in some part before, that for example, that we do see uh, like 1114 uh, translocation patients hardly have any MYC expression or mm. overexpression at least, right? Uh, for example, or that uh, a STAT3 signal activation uh, seems to be correlated with a 414 translocation. Mm. How that works, uh, I think we still don't know really. And we uh, certainly need to add um, uh, to combine proteomic and, and transcriptomic and, and, and of course genomic data to really understand how that how that works out. But I agree, um, I think that single nucleotide variants are just too heterogeneous to really have as a single one mm -hmm. an, a major impact because there's several hundreds others that also play into the field of how the, how the patient progresses or not. Right? So I, I mean, I to totally agree with that. And I, I think one of the things that we're starting to learn is that um, you don't absolutely have to go after the gene itself, if you can go after the way the DNA is packed and the chromatin is structured, you can use epigenetic type therapies to modulate signal pathways. Yeah, I, that's a good question because, um, and I would be interested what you think about it, uh, because epigenetic so far in myeloma to me has been challenging to understand. So mm. the data are very, you know, very interesting, and now with uh, with more and more like attack seek and so on, we see that there are there may be even again groups and clusters, and it's different from mm -hmm. a normal plasma cell, which is certainly not surprising. Uh, so, how do you think, um, or can we say or draw any conclusion from the epigenetic data that we have available so far? So, I mean, my my view is that um, you know, myeloma is clearly a disease of abnormal transcription that driven by super enhancers that are specific to the myeloma cell. And as we understand more about the structure of super enhancers and what puts them in different parts of the genome, we should be able to design strategies that tone down the level of expression of those deregulated pathways and then sort of normalize the, the plasma cells much more. So 
I see a sort of great future for epigenetics as being, you know, it's like the wild west of therapy development, you know, where do you go with it? Where do you target it? And you, you, we need some more understanding just to place it in, in the right disease setting. And so I'm, I'm kind of very hopeful about that for the future. Especially since you also have done a lot of work uh, around that uh, and, and looking at our uh, MIC data, protein expression MIC data, which is interesting because um, so we do see, of course, a correlation with those who have a classical MYC translocation mm -hmm. with, a, with, with an IgG locus mm -hmm. or so, right? IgH locus. But um, we do uh, see uh, many patients uh, in the relapse refractory setting, especially that express the MYC protein, but at least with classical cytogenetics or with IFISH, uh, we don't see any clear translocations. Of course, we know from whole genome data, there are a lot of others, but uh, mm -hmm. other translocations, uh, structural variants that might affect MIC and epigenomics, right? Mm -hmm. Epigenetic uh, mechanisms. So, what are your thoughts on that? Because I mean, you've oh, done no, so also I think some work on that. So, yeah. like, um, I mean, the MIC locus is fascinating. I mean, it's clearly a, a massive driver gene for late stage disease. Uh, you can get like translocations from one part of the genome to another, interstitial deletions, copy number gains, and so that whole topologically associated domains around the MIC locus are frequently affected. And we found like other loci, so there's a gene TXNDC5, FOXO3, these sites donate super enhancers to MIC and drive its expression up. And I, it's always been a challenge to target MIC because it's a transcription factor, but you, I mean, you clearly show it's, it's really important. And if we can focus on toning down its transcription, JQ1, BRD4 inhibitors, who knows, I think we may be really successful well with that type of strategy. The other area that seems to have been important here is, you know, what causes myeloma? And so like we did sort of GWAS analyses and the, the latest, um, kind of spin on what causes myeloma comes down to um, the feces, yes. <laughs> the microbiome. It's a tough subject to discuss <laughs> online, but... Too bad we don't have Leafy here, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, who absolutely. presented the data. <laughs> so, like, what, what did you make of it? The mouse microbiome? Yeah. We, have, we have to first say that it was about the mouse microbiome, yeah, yeah. right? So, and uh, if I recall correctly, I mean, what he showed is that um, the feces of American mice, <laughs> lab mice, drives myeloma compared to the feces of uh, Italian lab mice. Mm -hmm. Did I recall that correctly, right? In his VMIC mouse model, yeah, yeah, right? Absolutely. So, I mean, we know from solid tumors in terms of immunotherapy that it seems to actually play a role, right? Um, the microbiome um, of even in humans, right, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in patients. Um, I, I think it's fascinating, but uh, so far uh, not easy to explain. Speculative. Uh, yeah. But I, so I think the good thing that, that um, Leaf presented was um, this focus on what, so like, how does your poo give you cancer? You know, it's, it's an important question. <laughs> um, but he uh, provided some kind of hypothesis around TH17 T cells in the gut and their migration from the gut to the bone marrow and changing the immune microenvironment in the bone marrow, which is, you know, to me, a, f a fascinating concept. I mean, I know there are trials ongoing now with TH17 on in, uh, uh, tr trying to inhibit, right, and mm. so on, early trials, not sure. Um, I mean, immunotherapy in terms of um, other than uh, BCMA has mm. always been challenging in myeloma, right? But <laughs> yes. um, so I think that's going to that's be a very interesting question and an and observation whether this actually can be, you know, explored uh, therapeutically. Uh, yeah. But uh, I mean, as I said, so far we are talking about mice. Italian mice and American mice. <laughs> so um, way to go to reach the... Uh, uh, the patient, I think. Right? But I, I agree, it's a fascinating topic. So thank you, Mark. It's been great talking to you. Um, thanks for helping us through this. And I, I'd like to thank you all out there for paying attention to us and uh, best of luck for the future.